Hi there. My name is Elizabeth Petrui, and thank you for joining us so much to uh, watch this presentation on how you as a discretionary grantee of a uh, grant or cooperative agreement from the Administration for Community Living can use grant solutions effectively and really understand how to maximize um, what is what is required of you as a grantee and how you can be really successful in this endeavor. Um, I will be joined today by my colleagues from the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services and the Office of Grants Management, Valerie, Sean, Aisha, and Omar. Next slide. So, some expectation setting for what we're going to cover in this presentation. By the time we have finished going through all of our slides, you should understand the life cycle of a discretionary grant, have an overview of the grant solutions platform, and understand your reporting requirements. Next slide. Our session today um, has an agenda as follows. Like I said, we will go through the life cycle of a discretionary grant. What This will give you an overview of what to expect throughout the entire project period. We'll also learn what is grant solutions um, and what do you need to submit there and how can you submit it. And we'll also cover some additional resources that will be of use to you as a grantee as questions come up as they certainly will. Next slide. All right. Like anything, uh, life, grants have a life cycle, which is there are things that happen regularly when they are issued throughout the project period and then at the end. Um, every grant is different and you are certainly going to encounter unique challenges, but there are also some regular rhythms in the administration of a grant of things that you should expect. Next slide. All right, so from the very beginning, you're issued a notice of award. This notice of award has all of a lot of information on it, and it is certainly useful to you as you're thinking about um, what you, uh, who are the people you need to contact. It will identify your project officer and your grants management specialist. It says exactly how much money has been awarded, the duration of the project period, the duration of the budget period. There's a ton of really useful information there. So from the time that that is initially issued, your it will also say when your project period and budget period begins. Once your project period has begun, there will be monitoring that is taking place on the behalf of the grantor, which in this case is the Administration for Community Living, and that's going to take the form typically of regular communication with your project officer. Those look like check-in calls, emails, reviews of your grant materials. Um, you also have some reporting requirements. There are programmatic reporting requirements and fiscal reporting requirements. Um, at the end of a budget period, which in most cases is going to be one year, um, you will, if you're at the end of a budget period and then a new budget period is starting within the same project, there will be a non-competing continuation that is awarded. This typically just means there's a total amount of money that's been awarded for the entire project period, but it's broken out by year, by budget period. You do not have to apply um, to get the next year's funding, but there is a process that's happening on the Administration for Community Living side. You may also need to do a carryover at the end of a budget period. We'll talk more about what is a carryover, what is required as we get later, or as we get further into this presentation. At the end of the project period, which would mean um, if you were awarded a three-year grant, um, and it started in 2019 and now it's 2022 and you're um, wrapping things up, but you haven't quite finished all of the activities that you planned to do within the project period, you may need to apply for a no-cost extension. We'll talk about that in more detail as well. There are many things that may happen during the project period that may require an amendment. We'll talk more about amendments um, in this presentation, and there is a ton of information and resources available to you, number one being be in contact with your project officer. At the end of the project, there is a final report that is due. There are final fiscal reporting things that you have to do, and then we're also closing out 
your grant. So this is, like I said, a very simplistic 30,000 foot view of the life cycle of a grant. You can also visit grants.gov. Um, there is a link that will be made available in the resources to learn more about the life cycle of a grant. Next slide. All right, now I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague Aisha to talk more about grant solutions. Hi guys, I'm Aisha Perry with Administration for Community Living, and I'm gonna share some updates on grant solutions. Next slide, Andy. So to access grant solutions, access is always granted to the private, uh, the PIPD or the AOR, which is also known as the um, authorizing representative and your support staff. To get access to grant solutions, please use the grant solutions uh, home link to acquire access or reach out to your project officer. So you can either obtain access through the additional forms that are required to gain access. Next slide. What is Grant Solutions? Grant Solutions offers end-to-end -end grants management services. It tracks and receives all your awards, all your notes that are uploaded to Grant Solutions, your financial reporting documents, your general correspondence, as well as your change in your grant amendments. Next slide. What do you need to submit in Grant Solutions? So everything that's required of the grant needs to go into Grant Solutions, such as your notes, your semi-annual reports, your final reports, any amendments, such as your budget revisions, changing key personnel, carryovers, or no-cost extensions, or just any correspondence that you may have that's correlated to you and your project officer or related to your grant. Next slide. How to submit a note in Grant Solutions. Each individual must log into Grant Solutions using either your username and password that's provided by Grant Solutions. Find your correct grant. Make sure you're using the grant that's assigned to your organizations. I know some organizations have several grants with the federal government, but make sure you are uploading your documents into the uh, related grant that's assigned to that particular entity. A new page will appear with the existing grant note. Click Add Note and add your note or whatever, whatever correspondence that needs to be added. Next slide. How to submit a note. Add the subject. For example, if it's a semi-annual report, click semi-annual report and you can rewrite the reporting dates or timeframes. Choose a note type from the drop-down menu, such as correspondent or whatever that particular note is required. Choose a category type. Most likely it'll be a progress report or a financial report, or it may be some additional documents that's required either from the project officer or the grants management specialist. Add a brief description in the note field. For example, again, semi-annual reporting covering whatever that time frame is, or whatever, whether it's the SF-425 as related to your financial uh, requirements. Next slide. How to submit a note. Move down to the note attachments section and include a description for the file you are uploading. This can be same as the grant note subject. Likely they are the same when you write your, your note in your subject area. Click browser. Click File from your computer and click Upload. Next slide. How to submit a note. You can add more than one file, which is helpful if you're including more materials or additional materials outside of one document. Once the status changes to successful, from pending, click Submit. You should see all of the notes listed. You can then edit, delete, or view the note. Next slide. Log within Grant Solutions with your username and password, finding the correct grant number, and click Manage Amendment. A new page will open with all existing amendments to submit a new request and click New. Next slide. Select amendment types such as ACL carryover request, a budget revision, and no cost extension, or create a new amendment. Click the application control list checklist. It will open underneath information for the applicant. You should see relevant instructions. Next slide. Once you're inside Grant Solutions, you will see, as you see this uh, picture or screenshot, you will click on your instructions for uploading your documents. However, within Grant Solutions, there is a sample of what's required 
or there's a version of the document that you may verify if you need assistance, if you have difficulties in identifying what documents are required for a particular section. So within here, you'll see the budget revision section, the SF-425 section, the cover letter, the budget narrative, and any miscellaneous information that's required that's associated with your amendment. Next slide. Upload those relevant documents into Grant Solutions in the uploaded file section, and then click Upload Attachment. In the new screen, type the description of the document you are uploading, and then click the Browse, select the file to upload, and then click Attach. Next slide. Click Close. Check on the control checklist to make sure that the status has changed from red to green to ensure that the documents have been received in Grant Solutions. Any remaining documents, click Verify Submission. You will see all of the documents that you have uploaded, listed, and final submission and receive a confirmation. You can then return to the application control checklist to click Close. Next slide. Now, and I'll pass the ball over to Sean. Thank you, Aisha. Um, when will my amendment be approved? We, ACL has incorporated a 10-10-10 internal policy, which ensures that your amendment will be issued within 30 days of submission. The first 10 days after your uh, amendment is submitted to your project officer, the project officer has 10 days to review it, approve it, and then pass it on to OGM, which is the grants officer, grants manager. Once your grants management specialist receives your amendment from the project officer, we have 10 days from receipt to review your amendment and request revisions. <clears throat> In the event that we do request revisions, the 10 day clock starts over from the time we send you an email to the time we get your revisions and are able to review them and approve them. Once we review and approve your, your revisions to your amendment, we pass it over to the grants management officer who then has 10 days with it themselves in order to review your amendment and issue. If the grants management officer in doing the secondary review finds items in your amendment that need to be revised again, it goes back to the Office of Grants Management. The 10-day clock will then start over once we request additional revisions from you. And then we have 10 days from then to get it to the grants management officer who then has another 10 days to get it out. Right now, I know what I just described to you is roughly a 50-day process, but under normal circumstances, this is supposed to take 30 days, and it normally does take 30 days, but this is just to give the grantees a window into how we process the amendments. That way, if an amendment is submitted and 20 days later or so, there's a request from the grantee as to when their amendment is to be processed and issued. The 10-10-10 policy, like I said, is an insurance policy for us to have it out within 30 days. It also gives the grantee notification that it's going to take at least 30 days for their amendment to be processed and should take no more than that 30 day window. Next slide, please. And now I'll pass it up the ball back over to Elizabeth so she can continue. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Hi, um, so like Aisha and like Sean said, this is um, this is how you can submit notes and amendments within grant solutions. And I just want to reiterate that if you have problems, if you make a mistake, please be in contact with your project officer and we will assist you in revising your materials. We can even try to help you troubleshoot in grant solutions. If it is beyond our capability, we will refer you back to the grant solutions help desk. But please do not if you are not sure if your amendment has gone through just keep submitting multiple amendments um, try it once you can definitely send us an email to confirm that we received it and if it hasn't gone through we can help you get it in it will not help you or us to have you know 10 different versions of the same amendment floating around in grant solutions so be in contact with your project officer we want to be a resource for you um, next slide. And now I'm going to pass it back to Aisha to talk about budget revisions. All right, all things budget. Next slide, Andy. So when do you need a budget revision? Are you moving more than 25% of your budget between object class or categories within a budget period? If so, you need a budget revision. Next slide. What does the budget revision consist of? The following documents are required. A cover letter signed by your AOR, which is your authorized organizational representative, which should include your grant number, your grantee's organization name, a written justification stating the need for the budget revision, an SF-425A listing the proposed new budget category totals, 
a budget narrative or justification detailing the proposed charge allocations in each budget category. Once all of that information has been compiled and gathered, what you need to do is upload it into Grant Solutions as a grant amendment. Once those documents have been uploaded, an email will be sent from Grant Solutions to your project officer for him or her to take necessary actions. Next slide. All right, next slide. Now I'm changing key personnel. I'll pass it over to Val. Thank you, Aisha. Hi, everyone. This is Valerie within the Office of Elder Justice and APS at ACL. I'm going to share with you how you can make a change to your key personnel amendment. Have you had a change in project director or a change in your authorized organization representative? If you have, then this is what we require for you to make this key change uh, personnel amendment. Next slide, please. What we require, if you do have a specific change for your authorized organization representative, we require that you just make this as a note entry within grantsolutions.gov. And both Aisha and Sean and Elizabeth have already shared that information with you. If it's a change in other key personnel, we recognize that during the grant process, you're working on a grant and if you've had a change in key personnel, there's been an absence of a person that you notified uh, that was approved in your application or your notice of award, such as continuous for a period of three months or more, a reduction in time devoted to the project of 25% or more, then you want to make sure that you commit, submit this key personnel amendment. What we require is a dated cover letter signed by your authorized organization representative that includes the following, your grant award number, justification for the change in key personnel, that includes their contact information, their name, their title, their telephone number, their email address, a resume, cur curriculum vignette, or biological set of sketch of this proposed individual. Other sources of information or support that you think is applicable to letting us know about this amendment change. Any budget changes resulting as a result of this proposed amendment. Anything you think is applicable. Please make sure that you notify your project officer of the change and that when you've, noted, when you've uploaded this information into Grant Solutions so that we can track it, approve it, and it can be go on to be monitored. And I'll go ahead and now turn this over to Omar. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next category of amendments that we're gonna talk about and that you can submit in Grant Solutions is the carryover request. Carryover requests are really one of the most common types of amendments that we often see. Uh, my colleagues will tell you that we've seen a lot of these recently, especially over the last year due to COVID-19 related factors that have impacted the timeframes of planned activities set forth in many of the grantees' work plans. So next slide, Andy. Uh, let's discuss when it is appropriate for grantees to request a carryover of funds between budget periods. Well, the very first thing that you need to determine is whether you have what is referred to as an unobligated balance of funds at the end of a given budget period. In other words, do you have unspent money left over at the end of a project year that you want to be able to spend on project activities in a later period? Uh, and if that is indeed your situation, you are allowed to request a carryover of those funds into a subsequent budget period so those funds can be properly spent on activities that fall within the current scope of your work plan. More simply stated, and as it says on the slide, these fund funds can be used to complete project activities that were not completed in the budget period in which those funds were initially awarded. Next slide. Now, you should bear in mind that those funds that are car carried over into subsequent periods do not have to be used necessarily for the com completion of previous budget, budget year activities indicated in your work plan. In some cases, you might find that you have actually completed your previous budget year activities with no problem, but you still might have funds left over due to maybe cost factors. Maybe you initially budgeted for certain activities at a certain cost, but it later it turns out that those activities ended up not costing as much, much as you had originally thought they would. Maybe there are personnel changes in your office or changes in transportation costs or other unforeseen factors that impact the cost of implementing the activities in your budget. If that's the case, you can use those carryover funds for other different activities that appear in your subsequent year's work plan. For example, the funds could go from being initially used for, say, training activities for APS, APS workers in year one, 
and those activities are done to maybe being used for outreach activities currently itself or in your year two work plan. And those types of decisions and conversations about activities and carryover funding allocated to those activities, you can have conversations, feel free to have conversations with your project officer. Next slide. Now, it's also important to note that project funds may be carried into a previous expired budget period, but that can happen only under certain circumstances. For example, let's say that during the process of reconciliation of reporting, the grantee finds out that a carryover was never submitted through grant solutions to begin with, but the grantee's records actually do show an account and account for the use of these funds in year three, and the records also show that the related work plan activities have indeed been completed. If that's the case, what is known as a retroactive carryover can be requested for re reconciliation of funding purposes. Now, Sean, do you have any real world insights for us into, in terms of how carryovers might manifest themselves into an expired budget period and how that is sometimes handled by OGM? Uh, thank you, Omar. Yes, I do. Um... In some instances, uh, grantees will have remaining year one expenses uh, that haven't been paid for and also have an unobligated balance from that particular year, be it year one going into year two, year two going into th year three, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. In that case, if it's a situation where they have expenses that haven't been paid for in the prior year and still have funds remaining in that year, instead of requesting a carryover, they should be requesting a payment for expired funds. That way, in that case, PMS will release the will, uh, send the request to OGM for approval. Once we get it and approve it, PMS will release the expired funds into that prior budget period, so the grantee can uh, take care of any um, unpaid expenses from that prior budget period. Under those circumstances, if, if that's the circumstance, then the grantee can't carry forward funds from year one to year two, year two, year three, so on and so forth, to pay for uh, costs from expired budget period or prior budget period. Um, basically, it's it's a real complex situation, and once it comes about, I normally explain it to the grantees within an email uh, as far as what steps have to be taken, and they can't carry over funds in that situation and circumstance. So, if any grantee, once they review this recording, have those types of questions, they can email me directly, and of course, I'll include the project officer on the email in, re in regards to explaining the situation, but basically, a carryover is just a simple fact that it's simple situation is if you have an, obli an unobligated balance that needs to go forward and you don't have any unspent any um, unspent funds for prior year expenses. Now, thanks, Sean. That's very helpful information. I know that aspect can get very complicated, so thank you for your expertise. Andy, next slide. Now, your care requests request in Grant Solutions has three basic documentary components, so let's go over, over those now, item by item. First, you need a dated cover letter, and that cover letter needs to be on official letterhead and signed by the authorized organizational representative, otherwise known as the AOR. And your letter must have some very specific content as well. It has to have the grant award number and grantee organization name indicated at the beginning of the letter. It also has to have the intended cover carryover amount and, of course, the budget period that the amount is being carried into. And you also need a written explanation or what I call a justification of why the care of funds is needed to begin with, including the reason or reasons why you have unobligated funds left over at the end of the, of the prior budget year. And lastly, you need to provide clear details on how the care of funds will be spent in the subsequent budget period. So all that information that I just went over will entail the content of your carryover letter. It's pretty simple. Next slide. The second required item is you must include the most recent federal financial report or SF-425. This form needs to reflect the unobligated balance of federal funds in the budget period. And this budget, you, this balance, I'm sorry, you will set forth in line 10H. And you also must make sure the SF-425 and the payment management system, otherwise known as PMS, Reports are properly reconciled and are consistent. That's very important. If they don't match, you may find your submittal, or most likely you'll find your submittal return for reconciliation with PMS. Uh, Sean, you have seen that happen quite a lot, I know, haven't you? 
this need to reconcile PMS with a carryover requested? Uh, yes, um, a lot of times we uh, that happens. What it is is um, the grantee will sum, uh, submit a report to PMS for the actual disbursement amount, but in that event, sometimes they've uh, drawn down more funds than what they reported dispersed, mm -hmm. and it doesn't reconcile with uh, the, those same entries on the SF-425. In those instances, typically what I'll do is I'll email the grantee and let them know what PMS says and send them a copy of the PMS report so they have verification of what's been drawn down and what's been reported as dispersed. Mm -hmm. And I'll also uh, resend a copy of the SF-425 back to them and describe the discrepancies to them. And I'll give them a detailed description on how to correct the SF-425 and the PMS reporting so that they reconcile. And in some cases, if the grantee needs further assistance and guidance on how to do it, I provide that. Again, that's something when I do send an email, I copy the project also on so they're well aware of it. But most cases, it's a situation where I try to give them some leeway to handle it on their own, but I'm not going to call it a hand-holding process, but I will guide them through yeah. every step because it can be a complicated situation. Uh, thanks, Sean. That's very helpful. And we do appreciate the hand-holding every once in a while, but I, 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 I get your point. Uh, the last item you will need in terms of a doc documents necessary are the SF-424A, which is your budget summary. The, the summary should reflect only the un unobligated balance amount and nothing else about your overall budget. And you also need a budget justification narrative reflecting again only the unobligated federal funds. So those are the major components of your carryover requests. Now, if you find uh, and, and, and Elizabeth asked me, and Aisha asked me to emphasize this particularly, if you find that you have made a mistake after you send the carryover request via Grant Solutions, do not, and I repeat, do not submit your corrections as a new carryover amendment. Under these circumstances, please, please contact your project officer immediately to help you resolve the issue. Now I'm gonna turn this back over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Omar. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I think we've all faced a situation where we had a long list of things to do and we ran out of time to complete all of them by when we thought we would. This often happens um, in grants and where you have many activities that you plan to achieve in year one, um, but maybe it takes you a couple of months to get up to speed in hiring people, maybe acquisitions to acquire new data systems or other technology takes longer than you think it will. And so other activities get pushed back. Now some activities that you were gonna do in year one are now happening in year two, and that pushes back things you were gonna do in year two to year three, so on and so forth. And so you may find that as you're approaching the end of the project period, that you still have some activities that you need to accomplish, and yet you are running out of time to do them. Next slide. This is when you are going to want to talk to your project officer about applying, um, submitting an amendment for a no cost extension. A no cost extension is an amendment that extends the project period and it allows grantees additional time to complete previously approved activities from your work plan that have not been completed during the original project period. A no cost extension which by its very name, you should assume this, does not provide the carryover of funds into the project period. Um, it's no cost, just a time extension. And additionally, you can't request a no cost extension just to liquidate unobligated funds. There have to actually be activities that were previously approved and on the list to do, but just haven't been achieved yet. Next slide. So when you're preparing your materials to submit your no-cost extension, and this should sound very familiar based on the previous amendments we've covered, you're going to need a dated cover letter signed by your AOR that includes the grant number, a specific proposed end date, which can be up to a year um, from your original end date, and a written justification that includes the amount of remaining unobligated funds, if applicable, you may not have any unobligated funds at this point. Um, for example, if you're in a situation where, let's say you've completed, um, let's say you were doing a survey, you've created the survey, you've disseminated the survey, you've collected the survey, but now you need to analyze the results. 
and it took you longer than you thought to get enough surveys back to do the analysis. So now the time that you would have spent doing the analysis got taken up with your survey collection activities. You just maybe need like three more months to complete that survey analysis. That would be a perfect reason to apply for a no cost extension to extend your um, project period out three months so that you can finish your survey analysis. Um, you're also going to need to include in your justification an explanation for why the work has not been completed. So in that example I just gave, it took longer than you thought to collect your data and now that you have the data, you need to still need to do the analysis. Um, and a detailed work plan on how all of the unfinished activities will be completed by your new proposed extended end date. So should sound very familiar. You will also need um, a current signed SF-425 to go with that. So once you have all those materials together, you'll submit that as an amendment in Grant Solutions and we will go through the process that was outlined at the beginning of this presentation. Next slide. Um, this is definitely not meant to be an exhaustive review of grants, of grant solutions. Um, this has hopefully been useful to you to just explain some of the processes that are happening on ACL's side and to point you to where you could get additional resources. So if you visit acl.gov, there are so many guides and video resources on grant solutions. There are frequently asked questions. There are instructions on how to request, modify a grant solutions user account, for how to log into and navigate grant solutions, how to access your grants list, step-by-step um, -step videos on how to submit notes and amendments. There are also instructions on all of these materials that we've gone through about what you need to include for each kind of amendment. You'll just want to visit acl.gov and then at the top visit grants and then managing a grant. All of these resources can be found there. We've also included the URL for the payment management system. Next slide. Hopefully, at the end of this presentation, you now understand the life cycle of a discretionary grant and what is required of you as a grantee. You should also know how to submit notes and amendments in grant solutions um, and what are some common amendments that you will likely come across. We definitely know that grant solutions can be challenging to work with, but as your project officers and as your grants management specialists, we are here to help you and we want to point you to resources. Um, I think we really see our role as helping you be successful. Next slide. If you have any questions at this point, please email your project officer. If you don't know who your project officer is, they are identified on your notice of award. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, we hope this has been helpful for you. Have a great day.